remarkable creatures. The pollination services of bees is estimated at $200 billion worldwide and $3 billion here in the United States each year. We benefit greatly from bees, but we know remarkably little about them. The honeybee shown here is famous for taking floral nectar and concentrating it down into the sweet nectar of honey that we all know and love. Honeybees have very elaborate societies with queens and workers, and interestingly, individuals are born into these roles without career options, but born into their castes. <laughs> the honeybee is the species for which we are most familiar, but it's only a single species locally, and interestingly, it's an introduced species, not native to North America. It was brought over by European settlers some 200 million years ago and has been mass produced to make honey and to pollinate our crops. In the last 50 years, commercial production of honeybees has doubled, but agricultural demand for pollination service has more than tripled in this time. We're beginning to appreciate that relying on a single species to pollinate our crops and maintain our food supply is not sustainable. So I'm a bee biologist, but I don't study honeybees. Alternatively, I study native bees. Native bees have lived on this continent for thousands, if not millions of years. There's over 20,000 species in the world, 4,000 species in North America, and an estimated 200 species here locally. They're the unsung pollinators, the young sung heroes of the pollinator world, providing most of the pollination services locally. Most people don't keep commercial hives. So we benefit from these bees a great deal, but we know remarkably little about them. We don't know what species are pollinating our crops. We certainly don't appreciate their natural history and complexity. And so I'd like to share with you a few examples of the native bees that you will find here in your backyards. First off are the sweat bees. These are remarkable little metallic bees. Their name for sweat bee is actually derived because they will land on field biologists such as myself <laughs> and they'll actually drink of human sweat. Insects like most, um, bees like most insects are salt limited, so they don't mind visiting us for a salty snack. They're not afraid of us, so we need not be afraid of them. They range in coloration from metallic blue, green, copper, and gold and also the more traditional black and yellow coloration. Sweat bees and most native bees actually live in the soil. They don't make hives, but live under the ground. Their societies are small, most of which are actually solitary, and they'll only form very small societies, about 10 to 20 individuals. They form their nests beneath the ground, a few inches to a few feet. They form tunnels to provide uh, chambers to raise their offspring. And unlike honeybees, native bees do not forage for uh, or make honey, but rather take pollen and nectar from the environment to make these pollen balls. The pollen ball is in a mass of pollen and nectar and all the nutrition required for that egg to develop into a baby bee. So we can study the pollen ball to understand the pollen use and the ne nutritional needs of the bees. And they are truly small, so excavating these nests is very delicate work. Sweat bees are also of great interest to behaviorists such as myself. They have complex societies and are not born into their career roles like a honeybee. So during adult experience and interaction, they decide dominance and subordinates and roles in their societies. Here we have an example of a dominant female grabbing a subordinate by the neck. She'll bash her around that nest, and in doing so, actually causing the subordinate female to resorb her ovaries. She'll then become the subordinate forager, worker, and take on that role, and the dominant will be, maintain reproductive dominance and lay the eggs, at least for a short while. There's many altercations, and aggression is, is common, they, and they can teach us a lot about cooperation, but also conflict resolution. Another group of bees are the trap nesting or mason bees. These bees are obligately solitary. Like most native bees, they live completely alone and in, in never interacting and never having work or any help to raise their offspring. They're extremely successful um, and very diverse, 
but perhaps the least well studied and least well understood. They get their name trap nesting bees because they in fact live in found trap cavities, including snail shells. So they'll actually find a dead, broken snail shell and inhabit it, providing pollen and nectar for their offspring, laying in eggs onto their pollen masses. The offspring will consume this um, to be reared into an adult. They can usually put two or three individuals within a snail shell, um, and they will block the nest entrance with particles and debris to prevent raiding from ants and other predators. Um, so they don't provide any parental care, and they usually make a few of these nests over their lifespan. This solitary life history means that mothers and offspring never actually interact in adult form, so females will live their entire life independently and solitarily. And this is actually the way that most uh, bees uh, carry out their lives. And near and dear to my heart are the carpenter bees. They come in two varieties, large and small. So you might be more familiar with the large carpenter bees that live in hardwoods and you'll see hovering around decks. But there's also their small cousins, which I study in great detail. So the small carpenter bees are locally abundant and great, of great agricultural importance. They pollinate coffee, almond, melon, squash, blueberry, just to name a few. Most remarkable to me is that they're exceptionally good mothers. They provide very small uh, clutch sizes and really prolonged parental care. They invest highly in few offspring, so they're much more bird or mammal-like than any other bee I've ever studied. And so we use this bee in my lab. We study it to understand not only agriculture, and sustainable practices, but also behavior and the natural history of, the, of bees in our environment. So small carpenter bees are truly small. They live in fennel, raspberry, blackberry, and rose plants, any pithy core that they can gain access to. I actually started studying small carpenter bees in my mother's backyard as a kid. Uh, I found these dead broken stems and started looking at their natural history and diversity in biology. And so what was an early fascination with the natural world has led to now a 10-year career studying native bees around the globe. We can learn a great deal from these bees by collecting their nests and studying their natural history. We can learn not only their pollen requirements and agriculture importance, but they're incredibly behaviorally complex. So I bring these nests back to my lab and we can cut the nests open lengthwise revealing a whole myriad of in interactions and activity. We always have a mother who's dutifully guarding her brood, a range from eggs, larvae, pupae, and even young adults. Again, native bees don't make honey, but rather collect the pollen and nectar to make these pollen balls. And interestingly, mothers have complete control over the size of their offspring. If they make larger or smaller pollen balls, they make larger and smaller offspring. So we can learn a lot by looking at the pollen and the diversity within these nests. So they have a, a elegant life cycle. Starting in spring, these females are truly solitary bees, dispersing throughout the landscape to find these dead broken stems, to hollow them out and prov provision their brood alone. So they collect the pollen and nectar and make their bee, bee bread, lay their eggs, and they do this in a serial manner, filling up their nest. The, the female works very hard and long throughout the spring and summer months to do all of this work alone without the, any help from workers. Come summer, they maintain a solitary life habit, but they switch into prolonged parental care mode. These, as I mentioned, these bees are very good mothers, not only foraging and providing the food needed for them to develop, but also guarding and grooming and inspecting these offspring every evening, breaking down these brood cell partitions, checking on them and making sure that they haven't been affected by pathogens or, fu or fungi. She also guards the nest entrance with her abdomen protruding out so that ants and wasps and other predators can't come in and rob her brood. And come autumn is when it gets very interesting. This seemingly solitary society turns into a social organization. The mothers still remain on the nest and the offspring emerge and stay home for overwintering. Most daughters and even males will remain in the nest and they're just waiting for overwintering and will take extra nourishment from their mother 
in order to assure that they survive the winter. But interestingly, there's a special class of females, these little foraging daughters that are made. These foraging daughters will go out and forage and feed her siblings in order to assure that they survive the winter. Because they're small and because they forage, they don't survive the winter, these foraging daughters. So it's a true case of worker-like altruism. They're giving up their survival, their reproductive success in order to assure the fitness and the survival of their siblings. So it's a very dynamic and interesting bee to study because we can range from solitary to parental care to small societies within a single stem in a single year. So in order to understand the behavior of these bees, I've become intimately acquainted with not only their nesting biology and behavior, but also their physiology and memory and learning processes. And they're truly small, as evidenced by this <laughs> um, size scale here. So to do this, we look into the bee's brains. The brain is a complex organ, plastic with development, age, stress, and experience. And we can learn a great deal by studying the inner workings of their memory and learning processes. It's an exciting time to study brain and behavior, and there's much to learn. We know very little about the brain in ourselves and in, in most organisms, so any insights gleaned are very powerful. So to do this, we study brain gene expression. We can actually look at gene regulation within the brain of these bees over the seasons and understand bees' development, aging, health, stress response, how they're coping with toxins and nutrition in the environment. And we can see it's a very dynamic shifts between seasons. Here, brain gene expression as it's being turned on, different genes are in green, and others that are being turned down are in red. And we can see that throughout the seasons, the same adult females experience very different um, environments, and we can actually track this within their brain gene expression. So we're only beginning to understand this, but we're learning a great deal. So we're only beginning to understand the secret lives of native bees. Insights gleaned from the small carpenter bee can teach us a lot about native bees more generally and bees collectively, but also have broad implications to understanding insects, animals, and the natural world. So native bees are important. Not only are they wonderful models to understand brain and behavior, but their societies ranging from solitary to simple to complex give us great information to understand cooperation and conflict resolution. Most pressingly, bees are essential to our ecosystems, and we know that every third mouth of food we eat is actually supplied by the pollination services of unmanaged bees. So these native bees are providing the food on our tables, and yet we know don't know who they are, and we barely know anything about their natural history. So in closing, I encourage you to appreciate the small things. Bees are so much more than honey. They're not only important for our ecosystems and our food supply, but they can teach us a great deal about the natural world, biological form, function, and ourselves. Thank you.